up, gamers? I'm Jason. I'm Julie. And today on Dice and Dragon, it is our pleasure to bring you our review of Pendulum. Now, if you're wondering where the how to play is, there will be a card that's going to pop up right now. It will also be down below, linked in the video description. Just please, if you decide to go check it out, make sure you read the comments as we did make a slight error when we were filming that. Now, just want to give a big thanks to Jamie Stegmeier for sending us this advanced copy of Pendulum and letting us be a part of the launch of this game. Anything you'd like to say, Julie? No, I could say thank you, but I could tell people a little bit more about the game. So go ahead and do that. That's probably more useful. <laughs> it's a competitive game uh, that's intended for ages 12 and above. It plays one to five players in about 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, and based on player count and... and uh, well, the skill. way the game plays. Yeah, and the way the game plays. It is a real-time game, if you did not know. I would say it's probably, you're probably going to be closer to the 60-minute mark um, if you're uh, experienced and on the lower end, but you really shouldn't go over the 90-minute mark. It probably plays out at about 15 minutes around, uh, uh, a per round, yeah. Yeah, 15 minutes as including the council phase because the way the, I would, I like to call it the master timer, just, just my opinion, but it is the purple timer that really controls the round that's only going to flip three times, which is a three-minute timer, so nine minutes per round with some other untimed actions you can take. If you have more questions about that, check out the how to play, like I just mentioned. Now, what is Pendulum? Well, we need to talk a little bit more about it. It is set in the world of Dunya that is created by the artist Robert Leesk. Now, this world was controlled by dragons until the rise of the Timeless King. Now, the Timeless King has vanished, and the council must select a successor to take over the role of the king and become the new Timeless King, effectively, and lead the world of Dunya into the future. You even have a scheming dragon, I think you can see him on the box, that is trying to bring back the time of dragons. So there is some cool lore behind this. Hopefully we'll see something done with this, maybe in the future, another game. I do know that uh, Stonemaier Games likes to expand their worlds when they can. There's been some talk about doing some more with, uh, with Thighs, so maybe Pendulum will be up next. But all of the characters are asymmetrical. They play differently. They do have similar powers in the standard mode. However, there is an advanced mode where that will change drastically where your player, your sorry, your players, well, not players, characters. Characters is a better word, right? Yep. Characters will have different powers, different starting abilities, and it'll really change the way that you play. You do have a nice reference card that will teach you how to do that. But essentially what you're going to be doing in Pendulum is you will be trying to fill up your three tracks as well as gain votes and get the legendary achievement in order to be up for consideration for the Timeless King. To do that, you're going to be placing workers on the board. You're going to be taking actions. Now, some actions must be paid for, and this is all going to happen in real time. So if there's ever a tie, well, there's some rules for that. It's called privilege. But be mindful of what other players do, because if you're taking too much time, they might go to the position that you wanted before you and essentially block you. So am I missing anything, Julie? We've like, played this quite a few times. I We're going to get it to the table one more time. Yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. So what time is it now? It's time to grab our drinks. Grab our best friend or rival. We're rival, talking rivals right rival. now. Well, hopefully we'll be best friends again. We're going to take it to the table one more time. Yeah, let's get it back to the table. Eager to see how this one goes. We've had some tense matches of this. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to take a look at the components for Pendulum. And for those of you that are familiar with our channel but may have skipped over part of the intro, if you are looking for the how to play, we did release a separate video for it. So you can find it down below in the video description. Also, we did make a mistake in terms of how you would execute your actions for the how to play and partial playthrough. Please read the comment before using it to learn the game. I did pin it to the video. With that being said, let's get started. And as always on Dice and Dragons, we like to start with what's off camera, just because they usually take up too much room, which is the rule book. So we get a nice breakdown of the world of Dunya. There was a time of chaos, a timeless king rose, and he is now vanished, and we are vying to take his place. It's a well put together rule book. I like the finish of it. It's got a really nice linen finish. So you got your instructions for your setup. Nice visual as to how to set it up because uh, board placement is key. This is a real time game. 
You do get some explanation on the characters. Now we'll just skip ahead through the rule book. See a few shots of it, but I really do like the layout. What I wanted to showcase, which is very important, is the instructions for the two to three player game, how to remove timers from the game, as well as the advanced variant with glory, which is uh, interesting. And that'll probably come into play if you start playing uh, some of the more advanced versions of the characters. With all the plays I've done, I'm not quite sure how these base versions are gonna get up there. We also get a nice reference sheet. So it references the setup as well as all the different actions on the back. So use this to get going, use the back during the game. And then for those that are familiar with Stonemaier games, they may recognize the Atoma rule book. So this is the instructions to play with one player. Very straightforward. It does talk about how to use the cards, how placement works, how movement works. We also do get some reference cards for that as well. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna move across our setup here. The reason I wanna start over here is the board and everything is a little tight. I don't want to happen to knock anything off camera. So as you can see, the different colors of that we have for players. Also an example of the different workers, grande workers, regular workers. Now each player will have five of them. You only be using four because to get a grande worker, well, your second one is an upgrade. You can see the little hexagons for their privilege which will go there on the privilege track. Then we have these tokens here, which are for scoring on the Atoma track, which I'll just reveal quickly. We'll take a better look at it in just a few moments. Next, we have the legendary achievement token, which goes on these cards. So these achievement cards goes like this. Once you achieve it, you take it. You have to have this in order to get it, and there's the reward. We'll actually take a look at all these cards right now. So as you can see, they're all a little different. You get different rewards, and it adds a nice amount of replayability in the game. You don't need to spend the resources, you just need to have them available in order to claim achievement. Now, after that, we have these timer tokens, and I did knock one over. These three purple ones go on the track here, and they're used to count the rounds once they're no longer on the board. Well, guess what? You're moving on to the council phase. So keep that in mind. We have this other hourglass, which is for the non real time version of the game where you will just move it down the timer track, follow the instructions here in order to play through a round of the game. Now we're just gonna remove that because it's getting a little in the way. Here are the timers, so you can tell what value they are. They're mentioned on the board. So purple's three minutes, we'll look at in a second. The black timer is the quickest one at 45 seconds. Here we have the green timer, which is two minutes, and the purple timer, which is three minutes. Each player is going to have different resources. So we've got gold, culture, military. You have a max of 10. You also have your trackers to go up your different tracks, which is uh, power, prestige and popularity. And then the gray one for when you get achievement. Without it, you will not be able to take the throne and become the new timeless king or queen. You've got the vote tokens right here and they're all plastic, just like everything else. You only have one cardboard token, which is for a denomination of 10. Now, if you're wondering why Stone My Games use plastic, it's really for importation of games. You can actually find some more about it on their blog. Now, before we take a look at this stuff here, let's take a, well, not a quick look, but we'll go over the different characters. So each character has their standard size. We've got Lysenia the Implacable. For the standard size, this is all the same. What will defer for the different characters are their tracks up here, as well as their starting resources. We've got both the champion, as you can see, different starting resources, similar track. They also defer in terms of their starting cards. So you'll see the symbol that each of them will uh, take. There's four cards of each symbol. That's how you get your cards back. We've got Gamble the Briber. So you can see there are his cards right there with his starting conditions. We have Drenkir. The Insidious, 
And then we've got Mesoet, the Justicar. So lots of similarities, but still some differences between these players. Where things really get interesting is with regards to the advanced player boards, where the boards will completely change. You notice that down below here, it, com it changes the resources. So this is four resources, resources of any type, five resources of any type, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, now, we'll just take a look at these few cards quickly. So what you'll see here is we get reference cards for a little bit about the advanced characters, the strategy, what you should be doing to play them, and how you can win the game. So you want to hand those out, especially the first time you play as them. Now, I'll pick this back up. At this point, Lysinia is no longer implacable. She's now the alchemist. Bulk the champion becomes Bulk the warmonger. Lots of differences for him, as well as how he gets his cards back. Gamble the briber will become Gamble the insurgent. Cool ability here where you can get back a worker. We have Drenkir the insidious, who becomes Drenkir the tyrant. And he's got a lot of utilization for votes and starts with two votes. Then lastly, Mesoet the Justicar becomes Mesoet the Pacifist. And what I really like here, he's the Pacifist, so he just gets to acquire a province, doesn't need to gain any military. So we'll take a quick look at their cards. So we're looking at, now these are Licinius cards here for the Alchemist, I recognize the symbol. And the ones I have at the back, which I left there specifically, oh, not that one. These ones here are her starting cards. So actually, I'll take Gamble's ones here too, just to show you. So starting cards, seven gold, move a meeple, gain some uh, prestige, and gain a resource. You'll notice that Lysinia's basic cards are basically the same thing. Move a meeple, prestige. It's eight resources or anything for a new worker. In a resource. Now, when you look at our alchemist cards, that's where things get interesting. So, you get the resource and the prestige, but these cards are very different. So, ability to place a worker, but it tells you that what you can't do though. And then it takes four military and four gold to gain her next worker. Now, here we have the council board, and we've got a nice stack of council cards here. Uh, during the game, you're only going to have. 15 of these in play. The last five are always the same. They're instant victory points or a last chance to gain legendary achievement. You also have this gold card that's always up for the upgrade to your grande worker. You flip it down once you do it. Now just to take a quick look at these, you have some that go in your hand. You can tell by the symbol right there. Others are instantaneous by the lightning. So you just gain those effects, except for this one, it goes besides your board because you can now have a max of three provinces. You can gain a province, get a worker, sorry, to send your worker without paying the cost. Lots of cool things that you can do with these council cards. So you've taken a look at the board. The board's really just there to set up for the cards. We'll move it off camera for right now just so you can take a look at the Atoma board. So as we said, scoring goes here. You can decide what color. So there'll always be two Atoma that you're using. Scoring cards, you'll pick how things work. And then we've got the Atoma cards. And now some of these, I'm gonna just, some of these you're gonna be drawing during the game, tells you what to do, what to get rid of, where to move workers. If you're going to flip different things, different rewards that the, the Atoma will take. So fairly straightforward. But you also have reference cards here which tell you what you're gonna be doing with the Atoma. So just summaries of what is already in the rule book. At the end of the turn, you line up some cards here and that's how you determine their score versus you, the player. Now let's just place this stuff back where it was. We've almost taken a look at all of the content we've got for Pendulum. Here are the player reference cards as well as the council phase reference. So this goes out. On this side here, you can see just a nice quick reference for what you need to do when you're placing workers, council phase. Now, if you need a reference for how to call council, this is just that as well. 
The last thing we'll take a look at before we get to the board are the provinces. So here you can see an example of a standard province that go into your player board, boosting your resources when you trigger those effects. Now this is a standard one, some may be better, may get more war, well, more military. Otherwise you can trigger different things. As you can see for power, so this is a powerful province. There are others that are more vote related. So as you can see, this is really gonna be how you power up that engine of yours that you're trying to build. Now for the look at the board, there is a four, five player side and a two to three player side. So as you notice here, each action here is a separate space. There's your prestige track. Same thing on the green side. We'll just open it up. You can see what the other half of the board is, That's where your provinces will go. And this is the black area where you have an unlimited amount of workers that you can place. Now we'll open up the board and we'll flip it over just so you can see the differences on that two to three player side. I'll get it lower. So as you can see that two spaces on each section for the purple and the green connect to two actions. There's only three spots on the prestige track. Other than that, it is pretty much identical to the four to five player side. So keep that in mind when you're playing the game. Also the special rules for two player. Now there you have it. We've taken a look at the components for Pendulum. Now keep it right here as Julie and I will be coming back at you with our review. So Julie, before we get into our thoughts on Pendulum, is there a nice public service announcement that you want to make? Well, not really public service, but Something we need to talk about anyway. <laughs> so we did uh, we did thank Stonemeyer Games at the beginning for the review copy. We just want to remind our audience that though this is a review copy, our opinions are our own. But thanks again to Stonemeyer Games for the review copy. Yes, thanks again, Jamie. We really appreciate it. And uh, we have been having a good time with Pendulum. Now, I will, it's a little bit of a spoiler, but I'll toss it back over to Julie. You know, we like to let her go first, ladies first. It's what gentlemen do, okay? So, Julie, take it away. So, I didn't have a lot of experience with real-time games. Uh, we haven't really played a lot. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll disagree with you there. We have had some experience. I wouldn't I say said, I said we didn't have a lot of experience. I, I, did, I disagree. I think we have a... I would... I don't know. After playing Project Elite and... Five Minute Marvel, Five Minute Dungeon. Okay. I would say that we've... We okay, have... so this one's different. Let me put it this way then. This one is different from... Very different, I find, from the others that we've played. I agree. And I would say that neither of us have any experience playing a real-time strategy game. Everything else that we played real-time has been cooperative. And this is a big change of pace well, for us. Five Minute is not cooperative. It's just chaos. Well, but... you're still cooperating because you have to win together and yeah. you lose together. Yes. <laughs> Um, so this is very different. Um, when I sat down at first, I thought, I thought there was a lot of components. I was a little worried that, that this would be one of these games that I'd, I'd have trouble figuring out. Um, but it, it's fairly intuitive. It's fairly easy to play. Um, that being said, it is a little bit uh, chaotic at, at times, uh, depending on how you're playing. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to come out and say, that we played it at four player and at two players. Yes, and we've only played with the base uh, characters. We did not go and play the advanced mode. I think that in a situation where we could have had more plays at higher player counts, we would have done it, but we're really focusing on learning the game and our experience so we didn't get to, to those characters, unfortunately. So I had, I had two very, Two very. I had two different experience. I think I would say when playing four player or playing two player. A uh, four player, uh, which was our first plays of the game, uh, I had a lot of fun. Um, it was a lot of fun being able to, you know, you have to try to grab that resource, make sure somebody doesn't get there first. You have to pay attention to what's going on uh, in the games. That you can, uh, you can try to put a little bit of strategy in there and not turn necessarily a timer right away to try to, or turn it faster to try to. Yep screw over one of your competitors or prevent them from doing the action that they were trying to do if but they're not paying attention to what the, to what's going on with the game. I don't find that it's often the screw them over. It's almost like when you're doing it, it's like, 
I want to get moving. It's a real time game, so it's more to advance your own objective yes. rather than doing that. Yeah, because like, I would say stab. if you're paying attention to some everybody else's game, you're not moving forward. You have to pay attention a little bit to what the others are doing uh, because you have to. But you have to have your own strategy because if if you're just looking at what the others are doing, uh, you're not going to accomplish uh, what you need to, to get accomplished to be able to be in the end game. Um, so you want to be competing for the win if you. So there's a little, a couple of things with the iconography that I struggled with, uh, you know, that to, to try to, to to try to win the game, uh, to try to understand. I, I kept messing it up, and that's my own uh, difficulty understanding uh, the iconography a little bit. You kept talking about looking at the colors. Uh, so basically that end track, the success track. The uh, the banners and the symbols. Yeah, so the colors around the symbols are the ones we have to look at when it comes to that for the bottom banner part when we're trying to chain together some of our provinces, I guess paying in uh, to the king, basically, is what I would see for that. Right? Well, I wouldn't say necessarily paying into the king. It's uh, it's triggering their their abilities. It's almost like summoning your troops Working with the council because don't forget the timeless king is gone, so we're competing yeah, I to see become it like the king. I guess it basically it's political maneuvering. Yes. I think we're yeah political maneuvering. So I like that. to be able to use those banners, it's different ones than uh, than the ones on the right side of the board. I would say then that you're, you're scoring for yeah. your uh, your war, your prestige, yeah. and then your. So that confused me a little bit, and it, it, it took me for a ride a couple of times where I realized that I wasn't doing the right thing. Um, but that being said. Like I said, four-player game, a lot of fun. It's a different game when you're playing two-player game, and not that I didn't like it. Uh, what, sorry to jump in, but one thing I wanted to mention, because uh, you're talking a lot about the four players, and I, it didn't really come up so often in our two-player games, is the importance of privilege. That four-player yeah. game, we did have quite a... There wasn't many, like three or four, but, I mean, Julie and I were both reaching for the same province. I looked at the privilege track, and I'm like, I'm going to do something else, and a few times you, uh, you successfully got what you wanted because we were able to claim privilege. I know I blocked some people because of privilege. We dropped it at almost identical times or our hands even touch when they're, uh, you know, going for the placement. And that is something that we really didn't have as often in the two play game. I think it came up well, once during multiple plays. So I'm gonna call it the elephant in the room. Call it the third person in the room. When you're playing a two player game, there's a fake third person that kind of just sits on the board to use up resources. And I get the reason why you have to do that. Otherwise it makes it a little too easy. However, having that third fake player stuck in that same position all the time was really annoying. And one thing to mention, because I played the game solo, so when you're playing against the Atoma, you do have actually two fake players, but they move around the board. I'll talk about my experience solo afterwards, but it's just to say that I get Julie's frustration because there's a few times I'm like, oh, I want to go there. Oh, I need a Grande worker. And interesting enough, our last play of this game, neither one of us chose to upgrade to a, an extra Grande worker, which meant that we had some areas that were fairly well blocked off to us. It was quite obnoxious, yep. but that's part of the game. And while I do like it, I do agree with Julie that there is some frustrations at times. And I wasn't as enamored with the two-player experience as so for me. Player. For me, and one of the reasons I'll say that as well, and that's my personal way of playing games as well. Uh, you have to be able when you're playing two-player, you uh, you have to be able to think long-term strategy and think quickly because basically you're you're playing against the other player a lot more than when you're playing four player. You still have to be quick when you're playing four player, um, but it's it's a lot more about reacting to the board. Whereas when you're playing two player, you're playing your own, but you're really also, you know, just trying to get it faster than the other player. It's much I find much more versus when you're playing two than when you're playing four. I no, and uh, we, I just wanted to cite a perfect example in that last game where I'm like watching you and I'm deliberately watching because I'm like. I wonder what you're going to do. Do you want that timer to keep running? Do you want to flip it? And it's like just waiting to see because I'm like, can I get that extra So the last time? the last play of our last game, um, that purple timer, which is the master timer, I guess I would call mm -hmm. it, uh, had run out. And neither of us had looked at, had flipped it over. I was basically waiting for one more thing to deliver. So was I. <laughs> uh, but I knew Jason was waiting for the green timer, which had a little bit longer. I just needed the black timer to get me one more thing. Thing. Yeah, but you also you decided to block the black timer and stop that last thing because you looked at the time and you can't really tell 
until they get to the end, but you're like, dang, if I wait for that black timer, he's gonna get that green timer. That made a big difference at, at the final scoring. Yeah, well, what, I won by four, I think? Yeah, but that, that you blocked me there from a solid amount of points because I could have triggered military plus my two that I would have gotten. And I also made a mistake uh, at the start of the game. I looked at some of the positioning that I did and I had a plan and I used the wrong worker. So that's something that can, that can happen. And that's part of a real-time game. Now, you might be lucky. You might be able to swap them quickly on the board. Just remember, when you're playing real-time, it's not as worrisome in two-player because you can see where everyone is. But in four-player, if you do that and you go to swap, someone can just come in and be like, yoink, yep. take that space Yoink, from huh? me. Yoink, yeah. that's an interesting sound effect. So I would have been really interested in playing at three-player uh, and five. Unfortunately, we didn't have that opportunity um, but I would say that it's probably even that much better at, at three player. Um, so I mean, that's that's what I uh, that's what I would say. Apologies for that quick fade, but it was rather fitting for a real time strategy game. We had something that had to be dealt with in real time. It may have involved a potential, depending on the winner. Well, actually, it doesn't matter with either one of us. It involved a potential timeless prince. Now, with that being said, Julia just given her thoughts about the game, so I will now give you mine. Uh, I've played the game solos, and that is really how I learned the game. One thing that I found interesting about the solo mode is it has a completely different cadence and rhythm to it. Uh, we will be doing a solo playthrough and a how to play for that uh, in the near future, probably coming out maybe within the next two weeks or so. We'll try to time it for around the pre-orders for Pendulum. Uh, what you do in the solo mode is there are, are Atoma, and they were going to move based on the cards that you draw from the Atoma deck. Those cards also work as scoring cards, and you're going to draw a certain amount of them. I believe it's three, and then you're going to total the number of votes and the number of points that the two Atoma would have earned in the game. Now, it sounds like it may be easy, but those point tracks go up very fast. The real difference is, is that the Otoma only activate when you take a worker back from a space. So that changes the rhythm of the game. You can slow it down a little bit if you want. You can also try to play as fast as you can because when you draw an Otoma card and it tells you to flip a timer, you will not have to do that, provided that the timers are not in a position where they can be moved. So. Really cool, I enjoyed it. It's definitely not necessarily my favorite way to play, <clears throat> excuse me, Pendulum, but it definitely brings a solo aspect to the game and something that is definitely quite playable. Now, when it comes to playing the game at two or four players, I had a lot of fun playing against Julie. It's definitely more of a heads up game and uh, at two. During the, the two player game, I was really trying to sort of plan my moves ahead and get the right sequence of things to, to work out so I'd be uh, maximizing uh, my points. Uh, that being said, even though Julie doesn't like to try to plan ahead, we were still very much neck and neck going into the final round. I believe I was only ahead by three points. She ended up winning by three points. So just goes to show you that the game is definitely balanced. I also made some big blunders. Uh, in that case, I feel like the game probably would have been tied, but uh, I, I made some mistakes too, so <laughs> don't count your chickens. I've, I, there was one mistake that I made that was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me with my voice, I'm going to grab a quick drink here, just going to hide, need to handle something in real time. Yeah, so he thinks he would have beaten me anyways, he always thinks he's going to win, that's one of the cute things about him. No, no, I, I did not say I thought I would win. I said I made one big blunder, and I think the game would have been closer to tied if I hadn't made that one. It was the one mistake that really made, I think, a big difference for me. So that's the two-player experience, and uh, there are a couple uh, playthroughs out there. You can watch our playthrough, but uh, I think it's uh, exemplified, and I saw this. Uh, I haven't watched a full playthrough, but I saw it on the, the Reddit thread for Before You Play is How to Play and teach of the game when they're both looking at each other and says, what are you going to do? That's something that can happen if you're both waiting for timers to be flipped and you're like, well, if you move this one, then I can do that. Who's going to make the move first? Now, that will not happen 
in a three to four player game, unless somehow in a three player game it'll be deadlocked. In a four player game, everyone is trying to do their own thing and you really gotta just be making the best moves possible. And one thing that I really liked about that is that players that don't even have the most experience can be highly competitive at Pendulum right away. Now I think if you play the advanced variant of the game that that might be difficult, but in our first game, Julie beat me by what? One point, two points? I know I made a blunder there where I should have had one more point. We all made end. blunders, and I think one of the things... Well, mine was worse because it was the cards. I neglected to play cards. I had, I had untimed actions that could have basically made it a tie game. I think one thing that I didn't say that I would add is that, you know, if this... if. If you like to take your time and think things through and, and plan them, this may not be the game for you because you have to think fast and you have to plan ahead. Besides that, I think it's a lot of fun. And I love the real-time aspect, especially in a four-player game. We played the first round with the timer, sorry, untimed with using the timer track just to teach everyone the game and i could tell everyone's like wow this is going to be a really long game as we we're just going through it methodically as everyone had the time to think through their actions but the moment we put that away it came to the end of the game and everyone's like wait we're done it's over so that is something that i absolutely love is the pacing and i really think that at a three players up is when this game is really going to shine because you will not have that deadlock there's always going to be something going on and you can never make, well not never, but you can't plan everything out to make the optimal sequence of moves. It's just not going to happen. Someone's going to go into your space and you're going to have to readjust. I do, I really like the fact that the black space on the board is always open. If there wasn't a space like that, I think this game would drive me nuts. But overall, mechanically, pacing, and worker placement, which is something that I think we are actually getting a much more... Uh, an appreciation for it. I wasn't necessarily my favorite type of game, but after Lords of Waterdeep, I uh, don't know if it shows up on camera, but we've got the Brain Burner one over there, CO2, which uh, we don't love playing, but we actually love the game. And why we don't love playing, it's because it's like a two and a half hour Brain Burner game. So it's a really cool game that we have here that is definitely very different than everything else in our collection. And I love strategy games, Julie doesn't necessarily quite love strategy games. Well, I wouldn't uh, say that. You don't like long strategy games. It, yeah, it depends. So that being said, you said a lot. Is well, there anything else that you wanted to add? or you? Were I, was, I was just going to wrap up my point. The fact that this is a strategy game that plays within an hour to an hour and a half means that if you're like me or your parents like us, you like game that you want to get maybe multiple games in and you want a strategy game, this one should definitely fit on your shelf. I don't think I really have much to add. The game plays well across all counts, but the best experience I would say is, well, for a fact that we know, four plus. I'm not so sure about three, but I'm definitely gonna guess that three is just as good. So, ratings. So, um, I'm gonna, we, we tend to try to give the game like a, uh, one clear rating, not based on play, different player counts, but what I'm gonna cl clarify is to say, if this was just a two-player game, it would be a seven for me. At four players, it's an eight. So I'm going to call it a seven and a half. Split the difference. And for me, uh, it's, it's a tough one. This is definitely way up there. And uh, I, I want to may, maybe give it a little bit higher score than I should. But no, there, there's definitely some flaws. And because it's n and flaws, I mean, in terms of appeal, I didn't find anything in the game unbalanced or anything like that. I could give it like an eight and a half. I don't quite think it's a nine, but just because this is not something that everyone's gonna like and the real-time element is something that is gonna put some players off. And while the going through it methodically with how to flip the timers is entirely possible, very playable, and I'm sure that once you've played the game enough, that will work well. It's not the type of experience for me and it's not enough to keep that maybe half point. So I'm going to give an eight. I do think that this is a game that any fan of Stonemeyer games, strategy games, especially a strategy game that plays literally in an hour should have in their collection. So what time is it? I think it's time to uh, remind you to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell to be notified when we have new content for you. 
Also, down below in the video description, you will find links to all of our social media feeds, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So if you'd like to see pictures of Julie and I playing Pendulum, some pictures of our four player game as well, they'll be on all of those feeds. And popping up in front of me are gonna be linked to some of our previously released videos. So the first one here is gonna take you back to our most recently released content. The one that's over in front of Julie is gonna take you to uh, something that's related to a Stonemaier game eventually, as it is coming, you can see it up there in the background, we will be doing our review on how to play of Tapestry, which will be there in Wrong the Wrong shoulder, future. it's over your left shoulder. Over my your, left your right shoulder, not your left oh, shoulder. Oh, I... Thank you for the correction. What would I do without her? She's always there You'd to be make lost. sure I'm going in the right direction. You'd be yeah. lost. I would be lost without so, her. So I think it's time. To grab our drinks, what I was trying to do, uh, hiding behind the box. I think we're best friends again, right? We're best friends. So we have a timeless, well, we've had a timeless king, we've had a timeless queen. So I think because we're balanced, we can be best friends. I think so. Keep playing games. And then keep playing games. Really looking forward to getting this to the table with more people. I want to get another four player game of this in. It'd be interesting badly. to try a five, to see how chaotic that would be. Oh, five is going to be a mess, but a fun mess. Yeah.